wonderful speakers and different topics to go to. So I really appreciate your time uh, here to talk about nutrition, which is an absolute passion of mine. Um, I'm a registered dietitian. I'm Kristen. So I think they did some uh, brief like bios and intros of kind of what I do. But I work with patients one-on-one. -on -one. I um, have a private practice. So at the bottom of your handouts, it says Kristen DeAngelis Wellness. So if you want to go to my website, Kristen DeAngelis Wellness, Com. There's lots of great recipes and just some different resources there too. Um, so just to get started, I think everyone has everyone has a packet, okay? Because we'll be going through these. Uh, 45 minutes usually goes by really quickly. So if you have questions, just come up to me during. I think there's a lunch. I don't know. Everyone will have some some things set up and whatnot. So uh, feel free to come up with questions about literally anything at all. Um, I've heard and heard it all. So definitely ask your questions um, and ask throughout this while I'm talking too because if you have a question nine times out of ten someone else does too. Yeah. Um, is anyone in breaking it, is anyone doing the second uh, nutrition thing later on today? I might. Okay. Maybe potentially. Okay. So what we'll go over for the next 45 minutes is really just our foundation nutrition and Anna was saying, you know, it'd be really helpful to learn what what to avoid and what to include, but the why behind it. And so that's what I really want to um, explain, uh, really on a, a fundamental and foundational level. So food truly is medicine. Um, it's one of the oldest quotes that I uh, know from uh, Hippocrates saying, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So that's what we really will talk about. And it's, it's so interesting. You know, I was just teaching a, a, a class, um, it's where I immediately came from, uh, to come here, and we were just talking about portions and how portions have come just so, so far over the past 20, 30, 40 years. Um, along with portions though, what they're putting in our food, what the marketing <coughs> is doing, and to not be fooled by you know a pretty red label, or even you know we're trying to eat healthy and it's a pretty brown and green label and says nature on it, it doesn't mean it's healthy. It's um, the importance of looking on the back, looking at the ingredients, and then looking at the nutrition facts label. So that's what we'll talk about today. What are you looking for to um, avoid, and what are you looking for to include? And I'll just say right off the bat, what you're looking to include probably won't have a label on it because it's going to be food that doesn't come in a package. <laughs> um, but packages happen, and that's our life, and so being able to identify you know, some of those specifics is what's going to um, really be realistic. So. I'll start with uh, bad, and then we'll end on the good note. Um, so we'll start on the on the left column, and then we'll go into the right column. The right column is my favorite column, so we'll end on the good note. Um, and then, so we'll talk about what to include and avoid, um, some basic top tips, and then we'll start to come up with some sample planning for you so you can really walk away with a tangible, what can I do today, what can I do tomorrow, and get started. And then also what I provided was a few just easy meals and recipes that might you know, supplement into some of those uh, sample plans that we create today. So um, right off the bat, we'll start off with that um, foods to avoid column. And these are all foods that are going to be, if anyone's heard of uh, inflammation, right? Anti-inflammatory foods. Well, these are all things that cause inflammation that we want to avo avoid for several reasons. And, and, and inflammation, people say, well, what, what is inflammation? Like, what does that mean? Um, inflammation can present in obesity, overweight, uh, fatigue, migraines, skin issues, acne, um, inflammation of our joints, arthritis, um, heart disease, heart conditions. So inflammation can present in many different ways. And it's more of, you know, what we're seeing is it's, it's this chronic condi condition. Inflammation, say you, you know, scrape your knee, that's acute inflammation. We go, you know, all the cells go to that, that site to cure it. But if we're doing that on the inside of our body constantly, every day, repeatedly, it's, it's really going to present some problems down the road. Um, and I say that because I see there's uh, some younger uh, people in the room too, and that's important to address now to prevent some of these things later on. Mm -hmm. So uh, sugar, it's the first one on there. We're talking about refined sugars, added sugars. Um, does anyone know how much sugar, added sugar a day, we need to limit? Any 
number, thoughts, ideas. Yeah, more than five percent. Five percent. So uh, 24 grams of added sugar a day is uh, what's recommended by the American Heart Association. And to put that into perspective, a small sweet tea from McDonald's is about 40 grams of sugar, a small. Uh, a cafe mocha from Starbucks can have anywhere from 40 to 60 grams of sugar, depending on the size. So it's really interesting when we not just look at the calories, but how much added sugar. And not just the number, but if you go to the ingredients, that's the first place that we need to start going to. Rather than calories, yes, calories are important, but it's what's making up those calories. And we'll talk about that because sugar is going to play into this whole roller coaster of the, the sugar roller coaster and hormone balance. So I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, what sugar does is it's going to promote inflammation in the body. So trying to just, just decrease the, the total amount of sugar in our diet. And that might be, you know, we're not going to not get the cafe milk anymore, but maybe we can ask, to do, ask them to make half the pumps of syrup that they put in there. Maybe we can ask for a small instead of the grande. So there's just simple switches that you can make to drastically reduce this, the uh, sugar content. Um, refined carbohydrates is the next one, and refined carbs and sugar kind of go hand in hand. So that's your white breads, white pastas, refined flours. Um, beware again on that marketing of, you know, I see patients and they say, well, I have, you know, the, the brown bread. Said, well, we need to dig deeper into what brown bread that is. It starts off white. Yeah, it starts off, it does, it starts off white, and sometimes even when it says it's a grain bread, it has uh, refined flour in the first ingredient, sugar, a few other things, and then it has whole grain somewhere down there. But they've marketed it as a, a brown wheat bread. So be more aware of the, um, the ingredients in there. Um, it's, it's interesting, now I, I kind of wrote on here, simulates compounds A-G-E. It's just a, uh, an acronym, uh, but it's funny because it spells out age, right? You, you, we're talking about a, a diet for anti-aging. Well, that's anti-inflammatory foods. It's reducing the refined carbs and sugar in our diet. Um, so that would be, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how that plays into that sugar roller coaster, the refined carbs. Some other inflammatory foods. Okay, so MSG. Have you guys heard of MSG before? We often think like, okay, Chinese food, MSG. There is, MSG is just a preservative, and it stands for monosodium glutamate. So that word, sometimes we, you know, we'll see on a label and it says, um, you know, it won't say the word MSG, it will say monosodium glutamate. And if you don't know what that means, well, you're like, oh, I guess it's, uh, I don't know, it's something that they put in there. Um, being just more aware consumers uh, is super important, but MSG is very inflammatory. <coughs> um, it's just a preservative, so it's going to be found in a lot of those foods that are packaged and processed and things like that. Um, often in, so again, you may think Chinese food, but marinades or certain condiments, um, especially like meat flavored products. So, you know, the smoke flavoring uh, peanuts or something might have MSG in, in that. So just being more aware consumers. Under that food added additives and preservatives, uh, dyes, colorings, um, red number 40, yellow number six, like we don't really know what that does in the long term and there's uh, more and more research starting to come out. Uh, does it have a potential association with autism? Does it have a potential association with um, brain and cognition? And we're still learning in this field. And again, that's why, you know, nutrition can be a little bit confusing, if, if you will, right? It's kind of hard to understand what's the myth, what's the truth, and that's what's important of like, where are you getting your, your source of, of information. Um, I find sometimes, you know, all of clients come in and be like, oh, well, my friend said this, and I, I heard about this, and like, where are these people hearing these things? Um, so making sure that you're getting from a reputable source um, and really uh, something of what the research is saying. But that being said, the food industry has changed so much in so short of time that's why there is some, you know, continuing research to keep coming out on what is the long-term effects of, you know, small additives of these food dyes and colorings and preservatives and things like that. Um, so just, again, being more aware and reading that on the label. The last two, um, processed meats. So I've heard from a couple of physicians that, you know, just 
no one should ever be eating sausage and, um, and hot dogs. And I don't know if I, yeah. I'll never say that you can't not eat something because then you'll put it in your mind and that's all you're going to want. <laughs> but I, I won't argue with them. Like sausages and hot dogs, it's, I mean, it is uh, cancer, cancer causing, promoting, whatever you want to put that word on, but it does uh, lead to inflammation in the body. Um, there is, however, some healthier options. So we'll talk about those healthier options even, you know, with lunch meat. Not just doing a low sodium option, but maybe choosing a nitrate free option. Um, something that has reduced uh, chemical preservatives. So that would kind of be um, something to be aware of. Um, and then the last one is uh, certain types of fats. So an old myth like fat is bad, fat's going to make me fat. Absolutely not the case. It is the type and the quality of fat. So the fat that we want to avoid, like absolutely, do not include it, uh, trans fats and hydrogenated vegetable oils. So this is where it can get kind of tricky. So we think of um, Crisco, right? It's hard, it's, you know, that fat at solid at room temperature, um, which is found in cakes, cookies, pies, all that good stuff. Uh, but we forget that hydrogenated vegetable oils can sometimes be just snuck into a variety of different foods uh, because it is a preservative and it helps it stay solid. So has anyone ever seen Jif peanut butter? Standard mm -hmm. peanut butter, love it. Um, the reason we love it, sugar is the second ingredient. Um, there's molasses and a couple other sugars in there. But there's hydrogenated vegetable oils as well. Um, hydrogenated vegetable oils is the third ingredient. Mm -hmm. And so back to that marketing thing, right? Oh, well, I'll do the, lo the reduced fat. You know, it's green and it says reduced fat, so that one must be better for me. Well, that one actually has three times as much sugar, and it still has the hydrogenated vegetable oils. Um, so, yes, they, you know, cut down the number of fat, but it was still the unhealthy fat. And they added in a lot of extra things in it, so it got that same mouthfeel and texture. So being very aware, just because if something says light or low fat, it probably did something to make up for that. So just to be an aware consumer. All right, so that's the bad. <laughs> Let's get into the good part, because I don't want to end on a bad note. And there is so much that we can include in a very healthful diet, not just what I can't have, what can I have more of. So even if you take away anything from this and you're not going to take out anything from your diet, just see what can I add into my diet. Um, what can I add in another serving of vegetables, a serving of fruit, another glass of water. Um, so that's where I have on the first, the first piece of foods to include a foundation of brightly colored fruits and vegetables. And has anyone ever heard of you know, Eat the Color of the Rainbow? Mm -hmm. yeah, other than the Skittles commercial. <laughs> not, not <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we say that because it really is an easier way for, for uh, to kind of market that to um, our clients and patients. Because I wouldn't go around saying, you know, did you have your carotenoids? Did you have your zeaxanthin <laughs> and lutein and anthocyanin? Like, those are all these <laughs> chemical names for the pigments found in those various colors. So it is super important to be just getting a wide variety of the types of fruits and vegetables. And I really try to stress uh, focusing on dark leafy greens. So whether that's um, spinach, kale, arugula, Swiss chard, different types of lettuces. Um, and sometimes it's just, sometimes you're not aware of, oh, I never thought of when I'm making my egg and cheese, oh, I could throw in some spinach in there. Or when I'm making my smoothie, instead of just pineapple, mango, and banana, oh, I, I can throw in some spinach in there. It blends up very well. It's a delicate green, and it kind of goes undetected. Um, so it's, it's important to, yeah, get some of those really dark green colors. I talk about some of the different uh, types of fruits and vegetables on here. So cruciferous is that fancy word on the second line there. That's any of our gas-forming veggies, so broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, cabbage, kale. That's really good for our liver. liver. Um, it's been shown in some research to prevent cancer or reduce tumor cell size, so uh, very, very detoxifying um, vegetables. Um, and then I just brightly colored anything that's uh, got those different hues of orange, yellow, blues, and purples. Um, 
for a variety of different um, reasons of how it can support overall health in your body. Um, then we have allium, and that's just our onion, garlic. Using this to season, and you know, pretty much for anything I make on the stovetop in the skillet, I always start with garlic and olive oil, and then I'll throw on the fish or the chicken or the veggies or whatever you want to put. Um, dating back, I mean, thousands of years ago, the Romans and Greeks, when they would go on their you know month-long trip for war, like, they would literally eat onions. <laughs> Their breath probably didn't smell too good, but it is so powerful at antibacterial, antiviral, um, preventing infection. It is, it's very, um, again, food is medicine, and we kind of need to come back to uh, using food as, as, as medicine. Is onions good if you cook them though, or does it take away some of it? Of the, kind of like the strength of it? Yeah, if you do like a saute with onion and garlic, absolutely. Um, one thing with garlic, kind of like a fun little tip, if you uh, you have the whole garlic clove, and that would be the difference too, using the whole garlic cloves versus the pre-chopped, you'll still get benefits from the pre-chopped in like the little jar, and it might just save you time. But again, the potency of how strong that smell uh, is, how pungent it is, the more intense it will be and supportive for your body. Uh, but that being said, there's a, um, a little tip. If you crush your uh, garlic clove and you chop it up, if you wait about one or two minutes, it allows more of the antioxidants to like come through, so you get more of the nutritional benefit before putting it onto heat. So I don't know the specific like chemical reaction, but there's something something in the reaction of like breaking the skin. So is the jar garlic is it unhealthy for you? No, it's not unhealthy. Okay. Yeah, it's just probably yeah, I use it too for just ease. Um, and that's also too like using kitchen tools or using things that will help you make the switch and the transition towards more plant based foods. So you know, if I do want to include more of the fresh garlic clove versus the pre-chopped, maybe getting a garlic press because you know it just like saves you two seconds. Or a lemon press to use more lemon in your cooking. Um, it's two seconds to just slice it and then squeeze it over everything and put it on your in your water, whatever. I think that's included in one of the goodie bags. I told her a few things to include in the goodie bag. Um, yeah, so just using maybe uh, different kitchen tools or even uh, getting like pre-chopped vegetables so that you can just put them onto the skillet if you know you're going to have a busy week. So any of those absolutely are, are, are healthy. Um, so, and then the last one is fruits and berries, especially for any of our, um, our berries, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries. You can get these frozen too, especially in the off season of winter. It's going to be more nutrient dense if you're getting something that was flash frozen on the farm versus it traveled, you know, 5,000 miles to get to your doorstep two months later. So in the middle of, of winter, frozen is totally fine. Um, sometimes I'll put it in the microwave um, to defrost it and then add my yogurt to it and create my own like fruit on the bottom kind of thing. Um, but during right now, like there's the berries and stuff starting to pop up at the um, at the grocery stores that are also, again, when you're eating in season, it's gonna be a little bit cheaper too. I just read something about getting your vegetables like at a fresh farmer's market or something versus it traveling from Mexico or mm -hmm. wherever, mm -hmm. it loses so much of the nutrients because yeah. they pick them early yeah. and then the travel time. So if you can support your local farmer's market, that's yeah, a better Yeah, exactly. Choice. Exactly. I couldn't set it better myself. And Ohio is amazing. You guys have so many farmer's markets here. I'm from Massachusetts, actually. I'm from Boston. Um, and we're really fortunate. We have a lot up there. Um, but some places aren't so fortunate. We're in a nice kind of climate where there could be a lot produced. And absolutely, as to what just mentioned, um, eating more seasonally, we're going to get more nutrient dense. So, A, I'm happy. But B, you're happy because it tastes fresher. If you've ever had like a super juicy strawberry, there's nothing like it. Like, you just can't compare it. And that's the same for any of our um, fruits and vegetables. So, not only nutrient dense, it tastes better, it's also going to be cheaper. You're supporting your environment, sustainability. Like, there's so many reasons why just eating more um, in, in season. Um, and if we think of like eating in season, if we think back to you know thousands of years ago, more of like a, I don't know, the Indians here, or Paleolithic ancestors, um, they would eat by the seasons because that's 
what would support them at that time. So that's why, you know, during the winter months, there's a lot of root vegetables and potatoes and more starches. And then during the summer, there's a lot more fruits because uh, there's more water, right, to cool us down and keep us hydrated. So if you really think to this eating by the seasons, it is going to support your body in, in maybe what it, what it truly does need at that certain time of year. So um, eating seasonal, can't say enough. Could do a whole hour talk on it. <laughs> Um, so continuing on about other things to include, um, herbs and spices, I did a salad workshop, um, I, I do some work with TriHealth and I did a salad workshop Wednesday of this week and almost every single thing I use, mint, parsley, cilantro, basil, it, and people are saying, oh my gosh, I've never thought I liked beans and chickpeas, I never thought I liked kale. And it was the added uh, herbs and spices that made just a world of a difference. We've been to, a, been to a restaurant and you thought, oh my gosh, this is like the best salad I've ever had, but there's no way I can recreate this. If you just add in like a few sprigs of mint, um, and mint grows like wheat, so if you want to start planting something to just kind of trial out some of these things, um, adding more herbs is a wonderful to add in any type of any type of food. As far as just like a little tip, um, some people say, you know, I buy it and then I never use it. You could put um, some of more of like the leafy, the basil and parsley and whatnot. Just get a little cup of water and then put the herbs in it and just keep the um, wrapper, not the wrapper, the little baggie over it. And so that'll keep it a little bit fresh, a little bit longer in your fridge. Um, and then, you know, spices, it, I mean, ginger, turmeric, um, rosemary, thyme, like all, any herb and spice is very concentrated in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds. So absolutely some things to include more. What was it? Flaxseed. Oh, flaxseed. We are getting there. We're going to go right now, now yeah, to uh, nuts and seeds. So nuts and seeds are a good source of omega-3 fats, which is good for our brain health. Um, they also have a good amount of fiber and a little bit of protein. So if anyone's ever heard of like, you know, eating 12 almonds helps you lose weight. It's, it's just the fact that it has a nice portion of protein, fat, fiber, so it's very satiating. So in turn, if it's satiating and helps you prevent from overeating later on, then you're on the road to helping you lose weight. Um, so nuts and seeds of flax seeds, like like someone had mentioned, um, chia seeds, those can go well on uh, yogurt or sprinkled on top of oatmeal, or even I'll put them just on a salad because they kind of go undetected, and you really only need a tablespoon or two to get that benefit from it. Um, I would say if you have heard of flax seeds before, getting the ground flax seeds is usually absorbed a little bit better, and you can throw that into anything you bake, and you won't notice it, but the fiber and protein is significantly higher in whatever that you then are baking. Um, and then it's also for nuts and seeds, like nut butters, peanut butter, almond butter, kind of to that uh, example I gave before, just because I gave the example of Jif, it doesn't mean peanut butter is bad. Absolutely not the case. It's a great snack to have some with um, some apple slices or celery. I love it with carrots. It sounds really good. Um, but yeah, if we're doing a peanut butter or almond butter, not one is better than the other. I know people think like, Almond butter is the best thing. I can't have peanut butter anymore. Well, it also is a little bit more expensive. Peanut butter is fine. It has the same protein amount of protein. It's just the vitamins and minerals might be slightly different. Like almonds are higher in vitamin E, which is good for our skin. Um, peanuts have pretty much the same, no fiber and protein. So just looking and comparing the labels. So, you know, Jif compared to Smucker's natural peanut butter just has, yeah, it just has peanuts and salt on the Smucker's one. Or if I go to um, Kroger, Fresh Time, I don't know if there's like a Whole Foods around here, but some places have the kind that you can just grind it right out. Um, and that would be something that you could do because it's just, you can see. It's just the almonds or something. Do you suggest like it. the natural peanut butter versus the Yes and no, but not always. Natural okay. doesn't always mean there's like one regulation that the FDA has put on it, but it's really not a super regulated term. So um, natural, I'll give the example of natural Jif peanut butter. Right. It doesn't have the hydrogenated vegetable oils, but it does have palm oil. So it's still adding in an extra oil when the nuts itself already has the oil, but doesn't necessarily need it. 
Um, some people say like, oh, I'm not going to do that stuff. It has the oil on top. That's gross. Right. That's weird. Um, there's so many different brands. So some will uh, be a little bit thicker right. in texture. And I would also say just put it upside down okay. and then have the oil um, to kind of keep it a little bit more dispersed. And also, like, I'll have people say, oh my gosh, that doesn't taste like peanut butter. We, we've come so far that we think it doesn't, but that's peanut butter. And this other stuff over here, that's not the peanut butter. Right. And it's the same with any food that we're thinking of. You know, or it's, you know, we have french fries from McDonald's, and then you make them at home, and you say, oh, they don't taste like french fries. Like, well, you know, we're, we're trying to come back to using the whole food itself. And after, if you have like a favorite dish, come up to me because that's my favorite thing of the recreation of meals. Yeah. I love mac and cheese. I love burgers. I love X, Y, and Z. I can help you recreate your meal so you're making it more nutrient dense no matter what it is. I don't think I've come up with something yet, but I haven't been able to give some healthy swaps to. Um, so for the next things, uh, the healthy fats. So we talked about the fats to avoid the trans fats. The fats we want to include are omega-3 fats. So that's our fat found in um, nuts and seeds, in salmon and tuna. Um, I don't think anyone would probably be doing it here, but maybe a cod liver oil, good source of omega-3 fats. So those are all the ones that we want to include. Oh, and olive oil, you know, drizzling your salad with olive oil and vinegar rather than just a bottled, you know, Vinaigrette. Yeah, um, a bottled like blue cheese. But if you have a question for blue cheese, again, there's swaps for that too. Like Bold House is a, a brand that makes some like creamier dressings that are a little bit lower calorie and more ingredients you can pronounce. Um, I take fish oil. You take fish oil? Yeah, yeah. That's I. That's wonderful. If you don't like fish or you don't have it at least once or twice a week you might think about adding an fish oil supplement, which some people do. Um, and that's very, very good for brain, cognition, memory, um, some hormone imbalances. Um, so it's definitely an important, very important component. Avocados, I didn't even talk about that, but love them. Some people love them or hate them. There's like the two, the two sides. Um, and then we'll get into some of our lean protein foods. So. Whenever we're choosing animal proteins, this is one that I try to say, really try to do your best to um, find something that maybe at the farmer's market you're getting eggs <coughs> in the farmer's market. If you can get a little bit more information about how your animal was raised or fed, like chickens that were outside, you know, picking at the worms and they're out in the sun, they're going to have three or four times the amount of vitamin D from that sunshine. The nutrient profile is going to be different, and has anyone ever had a farm fresh egg? Is, is it amazing? It's amazing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and it looks different too. It's really dark yellow. It's more fluffy. Um, eggs can be in our grocery stores for you know two months, two three more months. than two months, yeah. um, and so that's why we sometimes crack an egg. It's a little bit more flat. It means it's really old. So um, just being aware of where your animal proteins are coming from. I really do advocate for animal proteins. Trying to look for organic whenever possible. But again, that's just going to depend, and I can talk to you about organic if you have some questions about that as well. Um, let's see. Oh, and then as far as our protein foods too, more fish. We're in, again, I'm from Massachusetts, so I just grew up on seafood like several times a week. Um, I realize it's not as much of a commodity here in the Midwest, but um, when you can or where you can, even if it's you know tuna fish or um, doing, you know, a salmon at least once a week. Kroger has some really good, like, has anyone done, done the fish packets? Mm -hmm. So you can go to the fish counter and ask them for whatever fish or shrimp or whatever you want, and they have lemons and limes and a lot of herbs, back, back to the herbs, and they'll just pack it up for you. And they'll always put butter in it unless you ask for without the butter. And you really don't need the butter because it steams right in itself, and it's, it's very, very flavorful. Um, yeah, and it's, it's just easy. So if you're like, I don't know how to prepare it, I don't know what to do with it, just put it in the packet, and then you put it in the oven. There's nothing else that you really have to do to it. So um, as far as our protein foods, and then um, beans, legumes, and lentils, these are kind of foods that have both protein, but they also do have fiber as well. Um, so very good, very filling, um, very good for a digestive tract. Fiber is something we'll come back to on the importance of that. 
Um, and then there's two other categories, probiotic rich foods. So probiotics help to bring balance to our gut. And our gut is really where 70 to 80% of our immune system resides. And we don't just eat food and it goes right to our brain or you know goes right to our heart and makes us feel good. Like it goes down our esophagus, into our stomach, and then things are digested and assimilated. So if we can address things here, it's going to make everything else feel and look different. Um, so probiotic rich foods would be things uh, like yogurt with live and active cultures, uh, fermented vegetables, so it could be the fermented vegetables from the farmer's market, uh, kefir is a fermented like milk drink, um, so there's some different things there. I realize not everyone will go for the probiotic foods, but I just put it on here because I think it is really important depending on what spectrum that you're at. Do you drink kombucha? Yes. I make it at home. <laughs> oh my goodness, I've tried that for Some people, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like avocados. Like we have the people that love it and the people that hate it. Um, kombucha is fermented tea. So um, it's it's a tea that has yeah, been fermenting, so it has some live active cultures. I make it at home and literally like feeds off of, basically what we're talking about with bacteria is fungus. Um, but it's good to have like these good bacteria, these good bugs in our system. Um, but kombucha, you, you may have seen it, um, Synergy is a popular brand. Um, it's a little bit fizzy, so sometimes like if people are looking for like a fizzy drink or something, um, I've even, you know, I was at Whole Foods once and they asked for my ID and I'm like, I'm just getting kombucha. It was 2% alcohol because it had been fermenting for, okay. for a while, so there's certain, certain things. Not all, I think that's like one out of the... I don't know if I've gotten it for several years. That was the only one I've ever seen. But um, yes, there's some flavors that are not that great. Like there could be a green or a, I don't know, some different like flavors. Or there could be one that's like a cherry raspberry flavored kind. So there's sometimes different flavors of it too. So you can you don't have to like it. And that's where like... It's an acquired taste. It is. It is an acquired taste. Absolutely. Um, and did you have a question? Do the capsules, I mean, you can get the probiotic capsules that you can take daily. I mean, is that as good as... Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, that's actually one thing that I, I typically do recommend for people, just depending on what their goals are and things like that. But typically getting a probiotic in, like, the refrigerated section will mean that it's still active. It's Again, they're, they're live microorganisms or live active things. So um, the probiotics in the refrigerator, trying to aim for something over like 10 billion CFU. CFU stands for colony forming units. So if you have questions, you can ask me about different types of probiotics and things like that. Question. Mm -hmm. on, the, on your waters, on your, your vitamin waters, are those good for you or not? Like the vitamin water brand? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's there's a couple different types out now, like some that are higher in sugar than others. Are they lower in sugar? Non -sugar ones. Yeah, I think it's it's a good way to get hydration. Again, everyone's on a spectrum. So okay. there's some people that are just, you know, going from the six cans of Coke a day and they don't have a cup of water. Right. And there are people that are just water every day. If I'm water every day. I drink like a gallon and half of water a day. Yeah. And, and I try to add one with vitamin waters a day. For like electrolytes yes. then. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that that would be definitely good. Okay. Um, and then the last category I have on here is whole grains. So whenever we're choosing grains, um, it's really trying to make an app conscious effort to look for the ingredients. Is this a whole grain? Um, does it have fiber in it? Um, and you know, more so than just rice and pasta, like there's so many other grains out there, like farro and couscous and tabbouleh and barley and quinoa. Is the quinoa good for you? I mean, yes, yes. Pastas, yeah, quinoa is excellent. It's really high in protein, actually, for yeah. grains. Uh -huh. um, and they started doing that one. That's why. Yeah, yeah, and it's and these grains are. I mean, quinoa takes 15 minutes to right. cook. Mm -hmm. It's very, very simple. So um, I do have a recipe actually on here for a quinoa salad. Um, yeah, a Mediterranean <coughs> quinoa salad. And that's just a photo from my website. I have some recipes too on on my website for more information. Um, so as far as I'm going to kind of flip over, and like I said, there's like a lot of information where it got like 15 minutes, so we'll see. Not 15 minutes, less than like 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to zone in on two things, and I'm going to go more in depth with this in my next nutrition 
uh, class that we have, I think, the, the next one. So if you're coming, we'll go over this again, but more in depth and in detail. So I'm going to go in on number four, having protein and fiber at every meal and every snack, and here is why. So this is why I asked for a little whiteboard for you all. All right, so let's imagine the standard American breakfast. They're going to wake up and have, you know, frosted flake cereal with milk and a big thing of juice. There's a lot of refined carbohydrates. There's added sugar. There's no protein or fiber. That's lacking. So I'll call her Sue, okay? All right. She wakes up. She has the bowl of cereal and the juice, and her blood sugar spikes up really high. Whenever we have a spike, that's a surge saying insulin. Insulin is a hormone. Remember I was saying it's not just about calories, it's about the hormone balance and what's going on. Um, when this goes up, insulin is released, that's our fat storage hormone. When we have a big spike, usually a crash yeah. yep. is followed after. So if you've ever been, you know, had something at 8 a.m. and now it's 10 a.m. and you're like, <clears throat> not just hungry, you're craving, you're hangry, yes. you're starving, um, and you want something sweet, something with carbs. I have a lot of clients that say, I just have sugar cravings all day. Well, we have to look at, okay, where did it start? Um, and so, okay, let's pretend we, we are craving, you know, the bread or the sweets or whatever. We have a candy or we have, you know, a big roll or whatever you want to put that on. But if it's just carbs and sugar without protein and fiber, the blood sugar is going to spike again. And then this is going to just kind of continue all day long. I want more, I have the high, now I have the crash, and it keeps going drastically up and down. So it doesn't sound like the greatest place. And again, when we're in these highs and lows, when we're in the low, we might be overeating, eating too much because we're you know, craving. Um, when we're getting these big highs and lows also, it's promoting fat storage, so body composition, weight loss, if that's something that we're trying to, you know, address, and hormone imbalances, so blood sugar regulation issues and some different things there. So we will play a different scenario, and can you guys, I don't know if you guys can, like, see that. Can you guys see that over there? A little bit, a little bit. Um, so we realize that's not the best scenario, so... Instead, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us can kind of uh, resonate with that. So instead, instead of the you know cereal, um, frosted flake cereal and orange juice, we're gonna make the orange juice a whole piece of fruit, and we're gonna make this a bowl of oatmeal. So maybe it's berries and oatmeal, and we're gonna put some nuts on there too for just a little bit extra protein and fat. So now her blood sugar is able to rise more slowly because she has protein <clears throat> and fiber at that meal. The fiber from the fruit and the oats, the protein from maybe some nuts sprinkled on top, and there's also a little bit of protein in, in rolled oats too. So her blood sugar rises more slowly and also falls more slowly. And now it's time to eat. But She's hungry, but maybe not having those intense, like, sugar cravings. So it's time to eat again. So she'll have a protein and fiber pairing. The slow rise and slow fall continues. So two things, right? One is I'm just going to put protein and fiber. So that's what we'll do when we're kind of creating your own plans, protein and fiber, and also the timing. Timing is crucial. If she had breakfast at 8 a.m. and... 9, 10, 11, 12 is like four hour mark. But say she gets stuck in meetings and then she's doing errands and she doesn't actually get home until three o'clock in the afternoon. Her blood sugar is not there. She's back down here craving carbs and sugar and is probably going to overeat. So again, the pairing and then the timing, those are two things that we'll work on. And I'll go more in depth in practicing this because blood sugar regulation is a key component for managing inflammation, blood sugar <coughs> regulation, hormone issues, autoimmune condition. Um, so you have this packet um, of what we would be talking about, um, but we only have 
I'll say like two minutes until our 11.45. So I want us to practice, um, and I'll give you a little homework, and then if you have some questions, you can come up to me after. But okay, how can we plan out a sample plan for you? And so I want you to grab um, the one sheet where it says pair protein and fiber. So put that right next to this. Yeah. Okay, and then the first thing that I want you to think about doing is write down the time. And so this is what I usually do with most of my clients. I just I just say without writing in what you're gonna have, we're gonna write down when, when you're gonna be eating. Because staying with every three to four hours is what we're going to aim for. So if you typically have breakfast at seven, count down eight, nine, ten. Okay, maybe I will have a snack at ten, and then I'll eat again at 11, 12, 1 at 3. Um, sorry, I'll eat at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That's three hours later. So I try to stay within the three to four hours. So just write down times. Some people might have one snack. Some people might have two snacks. Some people might say, um, I can stay within the four-hour range, and I don't have to have snacks until later on. That also includes, if you're someone that, um, like I had a client who was working with people in San Francisco, and so she was up until like 1 a.m. every night just finishing up her work with uh, her colleagues. And she thought that she had to stop eating at 6, she can't have anything else, but 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, that's 7 hours that she wasn't eating. Mm -hmm. So no wonder she was like reaching for cookies at midnight. It's because that's exactly what happened with her blood sugar. And so making sure that you're staying on time and routine. Our body loves routine, so be consistent, have that meal, and then don't eat anything until the next meal or snack time. So the next thing will be uh, filling in the blank. So creating your plan here. So, you know, a breakfast, I'll give you two examples, and you can just fill in something. It doesn't have to be my example, it could just be anything. So, um, something that, you know, if you're busy and you're on the go, doing a smoothie, for example. So you could do um, fruit. So I'm looking at this pairing idea and I'm going to add in, okay, I'm going to add some fruit, like maybe some berries, maybe I'm going to throw in a banana, um, and because I'm always thinking of the greens, I'm going to throw in some spinach too. I guarantee you, you won't taste it as long as you blend it up pretty well. But that's only our fiber side, so we need to add something over here, so maybe we'll do like a plain Greek yogurt, maybe we'll add in, um, if you want to do like a scoop of peanut butter, maybe you would do a protein powder, so that would be an example of pairing something on both sides. Are you okay with the protein powders? Yeah, I am, as long as it's not like a laundry list of long ingredients. There's something on both ends. So, yeah, there's more specifics. There's pea and hemp and rice protein, whey protein. There's some different brands that are better. Okay. Um, so that would be an example of breakfast. Maybe it's on the weekends. You know, you're going to do eggs, so it's going to be one egg, two egg. Um, but maybe we scramble it up with some veggies, or we have it with a piece of fruit, or toast, or all three, you know, on the side. So you can do, that would be an example there. Um, a few snacks, protein and fiber, might be uh, an apple fiber with peanut butter. Uh, it could be a plain yogurt with some berries. It could be hummus and carrots. It could be a whole grain cracker with some cheese. Granted, again, portion control, portion size. So doing like a baby bell or a laughing cow cheese or a cheese stick with a clementine, like that could be a really easy pairing for a snack that you include in the morning because you're not, you know, you're not super hungry, but you want to make sure that you're able to maintain the blood sugar regulation if you're not eating until one in the afternoon. So, so this is the opportunity for you to just kind of fill in on your own. Um, and if you need some help or ideas, I also have an example of sample planning on the next page. So you have the answers uh, underneath, but to make it more customized to you um, is where that kind of fill in the blank would be. So I kind of gave you like a day one through three, what that might look like. Um, again, it's going to look a little bit different for everyone. And then as far as using your protein and fiber list, I've also included some easy meals and recipes, which all are protein and fiber pairings. So you can see like the green smoothie, I had that example on here. Um, I have some oats on there, overnight oats. Um, I tried to make these all things that you could, you know, 
I have a one dish pesto salmon. It's like my go to meal. It's only 4 ingredients and it's amazing. Um, so there's some different recipes that you can include and plug into uh, your sample day. But I would say, you know, just putting it into, pr into practice. And that's where also, you know, having accountability. Sometimes we know it, but we have trouble doing it. We call it, um, I used to work with uh, Joe Cross. He's a producer in, um, in the film Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And so I worked with him um, for, for a year before coming here to Cincinnati. And he used this acronym called KIBD, uh, knowing it versus doing it. So now you know it. Education is a tool, is key. We can't make change until we know. Um, but then there's that next step of execution. And so having an accountability person, um, talking with a dietitian, um, having a group, group fitness class, having a partner, having something that you regularly check into. Mm -hmm. And again, this is an overall like guideline. It is by no means an individual plan. Um, that's where really every single body is very unique, very different, and that's where kind of more customized individual nutrition plans come into place if we wanted to work one-on-one -on -one or if you're working with someone else or whatnot. So with that being said, um, a couple minutes over, but I just want to say thank you so much for your time and let me know if you have any questions. I have cards up here. Um, you can go to my website if you want some more recipes or, um, or information. I'm about to be chickens if anybody wants some eggs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah so you can do this. Okay. We haven't got them yet. We're going to get them. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.